Hickok 45 here. Let's smoke some pot. <laughs> That's a good way to start the adventure today. I'm going to shoot it again. Yes, after I reload. Hickok 45, like I said, you can tell from the title, the year is maybe 1855, you think? You think we've gone back in time? Well, we're going to try to take you back in time a little bit with a beautiful Civil War rifle. Yes, an actual original used back in the day. Okay, this one made in 1860, so, but it is a model 1855. We've talked to you all about that and given you instruction what that means. <laughs> So, yes, beautiful rifle. Let's talk about it and let's shoot the thing. I'm going to load it again. Can I do that? I've got cartridges out here. Uh, look at that, paper cartridges. I'm not dressed up, but you know me. But at least I have some cartridges today to load it with and, you know, and everything. And uh, maybe that'll help me uh, load it a few more times, get a few more shots off, okay? So, uh, Yep, we're going to talk about the year, uh, 1850s, 1840s, as we shoot this 58 caliber muzzle loader. Is it? Is it a rifle? Is it a musket? What is it? It's kind of a rifle musket because it's got the length, but it's also rifled, okay, 1855. And that was the first one that was chambered in, in uh, 58 caliber. One of these babies right here. That's what we're shooting. 58 caliber Minier ball. We typically call them a mini ball. Don't ever think mini means small. It's M-I-N-I-E. Okay, it's not like a mini Uzi or a mini me or anything like that. It's, you know, it's just a mini ball, Meunier ball. It's named after the guy that came up with it, a Frenchman, Claude Meunier. Okay, so that's where that comes from. Nothing to do with the size. That is a big chunk of lead. <laughs> Y'all know that. <laughs> So, so you pull, you load it, and uh, then you just push the bullet down. These are like the American-made cartridges. These are not the Enfield style. And uh, you don't load the paper with it, okay? Slide these down. I, I got these actually from, uh, I didn't really make them from scratch, from Jefferson Arsenal. They, they come with a bullet in them. As you can tell, it's pre-looped. And, uh, and then I put the powder in and fold them over. And I don't think I fold them over correctly, but, but at least I got cartridges, okay? Because I don't always use them. Uh, well, really never. I'm just out here clinking around, okay? So 1855, this is one you've not seen, at least around here. You've seen my 1861. You saw an 1863 I had, which is kind of like the 61. You've seen my infield, my original infield, my uh, reproduction infield, P 53. You've seen that Mississippi rifle over there, which is a, actually a model of 1841. It's also a rifle. But now, again, folks, uh, up until, in, in, in this country, up until really this rifle, which is 58 caliber, the standard caliber for a military issue, uh, firearms and <laughs> muskets, was 69. I think the original Charleville that, uh, what, 18 or 1766 Charleville that many of our soldiers used in this country in the Revolutionary War was 69 caliber. It was a smoothbore, you know, the Charleville. And, uh, and in rattling up, you know, the, when, the, when the Springfield Armory was set up in uh, whenever that was, 17, late 1700s, and then we started making, I think, our first uh, rifle, well, musket in 1795. That was really basically just the uh, copy of the Charleville, and it was 69 caliber. Okay, and then again, uh, what the 1816, the, the early uh, models during the 1800s, the 1816, the 18, I don't know how many different variants there were. I know then up in, in the 1840, the 1842, they were 69 caliber, okay? So this was really the first uh, issue, uh, 58 caliber, as well as rifled it was rifled okay now that mississippi rifle the 41 was rifled but that was more of a specialty firearm and wasn't a general issue i see a little piece of that previous cap in there so this rifle right here represents a uh, an interesting uh, point in u.s military uh, infantry you know rifles it's uh, 58 caliber it's rifled and uh it uh it has the Maynard priming system which we'll talk about okay 
the Maynard Tate priming system. Pretty interesting. So, I wonder if it's gong worthy. Well, let's find out. <laughs> that is sweet. 160 years later, and it still shoots straight. Okay. Yeah, this one was made in uh, 1860. It's right there on the lock plate. Now, this one has been professionally, quote unquote, professionally restored. Okay. One reason I bought it. Uh, you know, a little more of a bargain, quote unquote. Uh, it would have been, I don't know, several hundred dollars more probably if it had not been touched. Like my uh, 61, this is the 1861 model. You see, it's not been restored, but it's in good shape, in good condition. And uh, I would have been happy to find one even like that. Very happy. Hard to find them. And, uh, but this one has been uh, restored and you know, redone. But they've, they've maintained all the, like even the cartouche on the, the stock there is still visible, very visible and, and everything. So it must have been in pretty good shape before they started work on it because it's all original. And it's just nice, just nice. So, uh, and I've had the 1855 model on my radar for quite a while. I just think it's cool. And let me run a patch down here and I might show you that. I might take another shot first. Let's just take another shot, can I do that? And the other thing I'm happy about is it shoots right on. It seems to. Whoops, whoops, you know, I did, I almost messed up here. In fact, I did. I uh, started pulling that paper out too soon before I poured the powder down the bore. So we may have a little mess associated with this one. But this is a paper cartridge. You've seen me use these before and other people. It's, uh, it's what they used back in the day. And uh, good thing I'm not in battle. I would just toss this one and <laughs> or stick it back in my, in fact, I'm gonna do that. <laughs> I'll, I'll, whoops, I'll fix that. I'll lay it over there so I'll keep it separate. What you're supposed to do is tear it off. That's what I didn't do. I didn't rip it off or bite it off. And then you pour it down. Got to talking to you all. And y'all got to listening. And that's what happened. And then you kind of push the, uh, pull that out or get, work down the ball okay and then do this a little faster if people are shooting at you let me grab that because i need that <laughs> in order to load this rifle don't i and this is a rifle musket it is rifled again and that's the other thing if i didn't say it uh most of the military firearms so i'm not going to cheat and use that yet and i might have to if it gets really dirty uh were smooth bore up to this point again the mississippi was a, an exception but uh, you have to have smoothbore rifles. I talked about that some in the recent video, the Enfield versus the uh, the Springfield. Hope you've gotten over there and seen that video. I'll link to it. But how uh, in military use, smoothbore just made more sense, even though rifling had been around a long time, because they were more into volume of fire than accuracy. They wanted you to be able to load three rounds a minute and get those rounds off relatively accurately, okay, at least as accurate as a smooth war could be. And just get the lead down range. You're gonna hit somebody the way they fought back then, right? Lined up each, against each other. And so that was more important, they felt like. And it, you know, if I load a ball in here, a, a, a ball, I'm talking a round ball, a patch ball, like the Mississippi rifle was designed for, you know, you've seen me do that with a patch, you got to pound it, and you definitely have to use the ball starter to get it started. It has to be tight against the rifling or you get no accuracy, right? And uh, so it was the mini ball that changed everything, the game changer, the, when Claude Manet came up with that because it doesn't have to be so tight, you have to pound on it and pound on it to get it down there engaged in the rifling. It's got that skirt and it's smaller than the bore, and when the powder ignites behind that, that opening, it expands it and contacts the rifling so you get that spin. So it goes down uh, easily, which is, you know, was quite an innovation, quite an innovation. All right, let's fire this thing like I promised you. Now, one thing about this Maynard priming system, it makes it a little more awkward to get the, the cap on. But you know, on the Springfield, it was just harder anyway than the, the infield because uh, at half cock, you know, you didn't have as much room, okay? All right, let's shoot something. Wow, I'm so pleased this thing seems to, to shoot right where you hold. So pleased, I'm gonna try to hit the buffalo over there.
<laughs> oh man. Yeah, if, if I were a, a deer hunter, this might be my rifle, right? So yeah, the 1855. So again, uh, basically smooth bore up to this point. And uh, so this was a big change, uh, a landmark in a way. You had a, a rifle musket, first general issue, uh, model 1855. And this was a standard uh, issue rifle musket for the US military. Yeah, I think uh, they weren't really available until like 56 and 57 especially. And, and then pre-Civil War, this was what people were issued with this Maynard uh, loading system I'm going to show you in a second. And uh, then it wasn't until, the well, 61, the Model 61, which is this one, that uh, that carried them on through the Civil War, that in 63. They did away with the Maynard system, and you'll see why we'll talk about that. So this was the first, though, and uh, this is cool. It's one reason I've always kind of wanted one, either a real one or a reproduction, one or the other. And I'm going to run a patch down it before I turn it around and show you that system. So uh, a guy named Maynard, I forget his first name, was it Frank, George, Bill, whatever, he came up with uh, this uh, this priming uh, system. What am I looking for? I'm looking for a patch. What did I do with all my patches? I must have hit them. Yeah, let me, yeah, we go. John's gonna help me out. I thought I had a couple laying right here, maybe not. But uh, it, uh, it, it, it sounds like a good, it looked like a good idea, like the thing to do. Here I go, getting that stuck in here. Let me uh, make sure I don't do that. I warned you all about how that can happen, and here I am. I didn't put it very far, though, you noticed. I may have to. You know what I do <laughs> sometimes when I, I do that? one solution yeah, I may not have time we have to may have to cut and make sure it works and get it out of there and sometimes John and I just have to get on either end of it and and pull it out okay so some of that battle stalking get down in there maybe if it's had time or not but uh, we may have to so learn from this would you and I, what I typically do is when I know the bore is kind of dirty, I, I, I go for a smaller patch and maybe I'll just dampen it a little bit and then you, you don't get this. But one of the reasons even I, I fall into this trap occasionally is, is I'm trying to get the worst of the uh, fouling out of there without getting oil or getting the bore moist, you know, the chamber especially. You know, I don't want to, it's obviously like I'd soak a patch and run all the way down to the bottom. Uh, so I try to avoid that. That's that's why I get into this mix, okay? This mix. <laughs> hey, look. Mm. I think it's going to come out. I think I'm going to get it. A little bit of muscle. Maybe. There we go. All right. <laughs> we hate to add it. We hate to cut, don't we? <laughs> we just keep our stupidity on film. That way uh, nobody can accuse us of being too smart. So, uh, so now I've got some uh, maybe a little bow saw on that just put a little more you can always dry out the bore there we go <laughs> so uh, this guy named Maynard and and you may have heard of the Maynard rifle Maynard carbine I guess it was is very successful and used a lot in the south so he wasn't a, a dummy or anything it's just that I think the system sounded better looked better on paper than it actually turned out to be you see the difference you get a little moisture on that and then be careful getting it all the way down because it's dirtier I'm down there we go I don't want that stuff to cake up that's the thing yeah so that's gonna be better okay that's good so I'll show you this this loading the priming system here okay so you notice the 61 doesn't have that you see the difference there of course uh, so let me cock that and get out of the way and uh, here I can get that open. This little door here, uh, let's see, it's got a little latch, kind of pull on it, pull it over, and then just lift it up. It's pretty tight, so that spring is pretty tight on it, I noticed. I'm doing this backwards, that's the only reason it's a little awkward. There we go. So, you open up that door. Now, what I did. Just for your all's benefit, I didn't have any of these Maynard tape 
of tapes and if you do find them they're going to be like ready to fall apart you know just because they're so old <laughs> and uh, i think they are available maybe but uh they don't they're not going to work or anything so if you've ever seen a cap gun with the rolls of caps back like i grew up with then uh, it's kind of like that a roll of caps basically and then they just feed up look at that mechanism see it pushes in see i just cut a piece of paper in there to show you one, do you see what it kind of looked like? But it would it would guide and push that on up, and then in front of the nipple you'd have a cap, basically, just like that roll of caps, that kind of thing. And you notice the hammer on this one, unlike the Model 61 lying there, it has a little cutter on the bottom, so it would cut the tape. So as it would fall, just imagine that that paper out in front of the nipple, of course, with the fulmin of mercury on it. So when it hit it, it would be a, a cap and shoot fire down into the bolster and the powder, see? So, ingenious design, except it, uh, it didn't hold up well to moisture. It just wasn't really reliable. And uh, it, most of the soldiers just didn't even use it because it was so problematic. And then they did away with it, uh, you know, on the, the 61, the model there. So, uh, but it's just so cool though, uh, that they came up with that mechanism uh, it's very impressive. Too bad it didn't work. So, uh, so anyway, sorry, Mr. Maynard. Uh, may, I don't know if your real name might have been Maynard G. Krebs or, or not. That might have been the problem. <laughs> just kidding. Most of you didn't get that. But uh, that's, that's just interesting. And, you know, it's, it's also interesting. John and I were talking about how, like, you think they would have figured that out. Because it was really, I don't know if it was a total failure, but it was about as close as you can get to being totally a failure. Uh, the Maynard priming system, uh, you would think that that would have been discovered, you know. Uh, think about in the last few years, some of the polymer firearms and different things that have come out, and they've had a problem, and it's something we won't mention any names, right? But uh, you think, why didn't you see that? Why didn't you see that uh, coming, you know? And then they have the recalls or whatever, and then they fix it, and then it's fine. And there have been several things I know in the last five or six years that, that we've talked about and you know, shooters have talked about. So, geez, uh, what is going on with some of the gun companies? All you'd have to do is send out five of these with some actual shooters, YouTubers or whoever, and they would have discovered these problems within about 200 rounds, you know? But yet here they are manufacturing these things and shipping them like crazy and and they'll have a problem. But, you know, it's just, so, so even back then, the point there is, I'm just gonna dig that thing out, get him out and put him in there. All right, cartridge, paper cartridge. So when the bore is not too awfully filthy, you know, uh, you know these uh, ramrods come with the gun actually work. That's why they're able to use these. Now, if you had a Hawken rifle or something, that you may, yeah, many of you have them, you know, you hunt with it or whatever, you you know the the ramrod that comes with it sometimes it's hard to, to 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 use if it's really dirty and that's why rods like this are so popular for like the range and different things or for cleaning because you get a little more leverage that's why i'm always using that one i'm just shooting from the shooting range uh, table here so it doesn't really matter but if you're loading many balls you know they work pretty well all right so that's the maynard priming system it's a <laughs> an interesting device and at least you could still cap it you know you could still get a cap on it and uh wow thankfully you could it does make it a little harder well you just have to push it on there uh because you don't have as much room yeah you better watch it here i discovered though if you get the the little wings yeah behind it yeah it'll go right on there okay gosh i haven't missed yet we gotta miss something how about let's shoot this paper see if i can miss that Good old Civil War rifle. I mean, actually, a pre-Civil War rifle, right? The 1855. So, uh, Civil War began April of 61, folks. 1861, okay, for my relatives in Kentucky. 1861, and uh, so you know this was in production. It was uh, issued south, north, everywhere. There, there was no south, north as you know it became in the uh, uh, 1860s. But uh, so this was the the rifle that people. So it was used on. Uh, both the South and the North, right? It was out there, and, and it was used throughout the war, the 1855. Okay, let's see if we can hit a bullseye. <laughs> wow, so accurate at that long range, huh? 
as I've said before, it's it's one thing to have a really gun, a cool gun that you really like, uh, and and then maybe it's even historical in some ways, but then for it to shoot right where you point it, that's quite a bonus, isn't it? So a little cartridge. Let's see if I can use this one correctly. Okay. Okay. Let me squeeze it. Let me squeeze that ball down in there. I'm gonna rip it out. It <laughs> wants to rip out. Okay. I was really glad to find them, uh, Jefferson Arsenal, get the, get those made like that. I'm too lazy to make them. I did make some a few years ago. Notice here I get your tulip you know, ramrod there, and that helps keep from doing damage to the end of the uh, mini ball. See, kind of get the same shape. All right. Put that back you don't want to lose your ramrod you're in trouble if you do all kinds of weird things happen of course in battle they'd not take them out and they'd shoot the ramrod at the enemy and all that kind of stuff would go on as you can imagine they would load in the heat of the battle and craziness they would end up sometimes i have four or five loads in there you know i can see how that could happen a number of different ways just from the the being oh, you know the the anxiousness of the situation and uh, you think you've loaded and you think you shot and maybe you forgot to put powder in, you know, and then, oh, what's wrong? I didn't load. Then she load again or whatever. Or some, you drop your gun, someone else picks it up or you get shot. Someone else picks up your rifle and they, they proceed to load it. They don't even know it's loaded and they load it again and all sorts of things could happen, I guess. I'm not going to shoot all the targets, of course, because uh, some of you have a life you want to get back to. But I think I need to shoot a ram or shoot at him. <laughs> all right. I still have a habit of cocking after I get out because I like to, uh, I'll just let it air out. All right. Man, let me get these mini balls where you can take a good look at them, too. So yeah, the 58 caliber replaced the 69 caliber, and uh, we've got a uh, now we've got a rifled, uh, you know, firearm, a musket. So we got a lot more accuracy. Uh, again, quite a game changer. Uh, just uh, an amazing change to where you can, like for example, a smoothbore with a, a bullet or whatever you're shooting like that. You may get some kind of decent accuracy out at 50 yards, maybe up to 100. You might hit something you're trying to hit. Uh, I don't know, we might struggle to hit the gong, you know. But with one of these, they're, they're very accurate, out to you know, three, four, five hundred yards or further away, however far away you can shoot and see something, right? Again, if you've uh, read anything about Jack Henson up around Dover, Tennessee, you know, Fort Donaldson, the battle, Donaldson, etc., and uh, what he did with a 50 caliber rifle, it wasn't one of these, it was one he had made, but it was, uh, he shot many balls in it. And uh, just the accuracy of these things in a rifle are pretty astounding. Not from me necessarily, but uh, they can be very, very accurate. And uh, see anything else about it? Again, you can see it's the same rifle as a 61. I got a lot of trash out here. Got the old 49 pocket line here. And, uh, but yeah, you know, it's the same rifle right out there basically, except for that Maynard uh, priming system primarily is the big difference and you got a patch box that is that is cool it's always cool to have a patch box i wonder what's in it oh patches of all things i wonder how long those have been in there uh oh was there something else in there a piece of parchment what that's a or if it says anything it's direct ah u.s grant left me a note Quit talking and shoot the damn gun. Can you believe that? That's rude. That's rude. <laughs> Speaking of Fort Donaldson, right? Almost forgot I had patches in there. Could I could have grabbed those when I needed patches. But uh, yeah, just a really, really nice rifle and uh, a piece of history. You got your clean out screw here too. When they put that bolster out further, they put a, a clean out screw on it. And again, one thing the Maynard uh, system required them to do so you got this contraption, <laughs> unfortunately, that didn't really work very well. But in order to have that, you know, it, it, you know, your hammer and all that to work right, you move the nipple out a little bit. 
okay, out further away from the breach and chamber there. And so they put a clean out screw in the bolster there. They felt like that might, they might need that, you know, and, and so you're, you got your fire going down and across to get to the fire, more so than on that Mississippi rifle. You can see that's more of a direct line, you know, into the, the chamber, okay? But this Maynard system required that, that change. And then of course they continued that even with the 61, you still got that same angle and uh, the bolster and everything over there, even though you don't have the, the Maynard primer system on it. So, all right, let's load it and shoot it at least one more, one more time, okay? I know you're getting tired of hearing about all this history. And, uh, and uh, all this mess, it is messy, isn't it? Even when you try not to be, try for videos, we try not to be quite as messy and uh, create a, a beautiful table. But, uh, you know, black powder just is messy. And uh, you know, no way around it. You know, my hands aren't as messy as they usually are, but uh, can get very messy. Shooting about 65 grains, that's what I put in here. And uh, with this mini ball, this is kind of the old style mini ball. So I got the powder in. Let's push the ball out of there. See if that will push out, yeah. Okay, load him up. Use the gun's ramrod again. Hey, was there anything else you wanted to know about it? Yeah. Uh, one last thing. The, uh, these were made at the Springfield Armory and the uh, Harper's Ferry Armory, which was in Virginia at the time. And uh, when the war broke out, the, uh, the Union or the soldiers, they tried to burn Harper's Ferry because they knew that the Confederates were headed that way to take it over. So they tried to just burn it. And uh, the ta local townspeople there in Harper's Ferry, that was that meant a lot of jobs to them, I guess. They put the fire out and the Confederates took all the machinery and, and whatever guns were there to Richmond, Virginia, and they set up operation there. And uh, you may have heard of the Richmond rifle, I, guess, I think it's called. Well, that was essentially this rifle without the Maynard priming system. And that's why it has kind of the, the hump and everything. I think the early ones do, uh, but it doesn't have doesn't have U.S. on it, okay? It was a Confederate operation in Richmond, Virginia. So you may have seen some of those. All right, uh, what am I doing? I've got the rod, the ball down, so I'm ready to put a primer on. It's one of the uh, issues when you're yakking and trying to load these things. Some of you, I'm sure, have had that experience at the range where you're shooting muzzle loaders and you get to talking with your buddy and uh, you end up dry balling or something. All right. You've probably, you've probably been listening long enough. What should I put the last round on? We don't want to end on a miss, do we? Well, we've hit the gong, we've, we've popped some animals. Why don't we just shoot uh, a two liter? How about, how about a Kentucky two liter to wrap up on? One, two. All right. <laughs> Yeah, got to hit it two liter. So uh, there it is. Little message from U.S. Grant, and uh, and uh, just a, a interesting piece of history. 1855 model, made in 1860. This particular one, it was made. They were made, I think, and well, this was about the last year, 61, 60, 61, and uh, it went through different variations. A lot of you're not interested in four or five different types. But it's basically the same gun. Uh, the early one had a big ladder side on it. The first ones, uh, they didn't have a patch box until I think around 57, 58, long in there. And uh, they had a, the early ones, if you see one, it, some of them have a brass nose cap on them. So by 58, 1858, I think all of them looked pretty much like this. Had the, the patch box and, and uh, you know, the, the metal of the iron nose cap and uh, the simpler site, the same site, pretty much that the 1861 has. And uh, this looks like what it ought to look like. So uh, another piece of history and it still works. I mean, that's just uh, always impressive to me. What did we figure 160, yeah, 40 plus 100 plus 20, 161 years old this baby is and uh, still shoots fine. Life is good. Uh, it's a long walk from where I had to shoot that.
Oh man. Oh hey, didn't see you guys there. Since you're here, I want to let you know about our friends over at Talon Grips and Ballastall. TalonGunGrips.com. Check out everything they have over there. You can get lots of different grips, the stick-on grip textures for your handguns and rifle grips. So go check them out. Also, Ballastall. They're a firearms lubricant or anything else you might need lubricating. Uh, it's water soluble and non-toxic. Been using it on the compound and cleaning all of our guns. It's a cleaner and a lube for over 10 years. So Ballastall, Talon Grips, definitely check both of those companies out. And also, while you're on the internet, don't forget to go to Hickok45.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Hickok45, Twitter, Hickok45, Instagram, The Real Hickok45. And also, I have an Instagram page where I post behind the scenes stuff and different things like that. John, J O H N underscore H I C K O K 45 on Instagram. And uh, the next thing you have to do is watch more videos.